Hello and welcome to You've Seen It Before, movie reviews and connections in mind, and welcome back to another installment of I've Never Seen It Before. This is just my uh, series of movie reviews of films that I've been meaning to see for a while now, but for one reason or another never got around to it until now. And this time around I'm reviewing Enemy at the Gates, which is a 2001 World War II film centering around the Battle of Stalingrad. Uh, this features uh, Jude Law, Joseph Fiennes, Rachel Weiss, Ed Harris, Bob Hoskins, among others. And this is the fictionalized uh, account of a uh, real-life Soviet sniper who uh, was at the Battle of Stalingrad and the uh, Soviet propaganda ministry has created, uh, built him up as this hero of Stalingrad, someone to, for the troops to rally around and to give them hope. And he's really good at being a sniper, and so good, in fact, that the Germans actually bring in uh, their, their, the leader of their sniper school to uh, take him out. And so, uh, in the ruins of Stalingrad, a duel of snipers is going on, and many uh, other people are getting in the way, uh, in between these two people with disastrous consequences. Um, it should be go without saying that this review go, uh, will go into spoilers of uh, an 18-year-old movie, but... Um, but let's just talk about the, this film and is it any good? I'd say I have a, I'm a, I, bleh, I have an affinity for World War II fa uh, films and I think that this is probably one of the, the good ones. Um, not the best that I've seen ever, but certainly has the, uh, the war vibe down. Um, the set design is incredible. Um, this, this, um, this, uh, the, the way that these sets are built and how they shot it, it really does feel like you're in Stalingrad in the winter of 1942. Um, this, uh, the characters are actually ra rather uh, likable and fleshed out. Uh, Jude Law does a great job with the performance. Um, Ed Harris does a really good job of being a, myster uh, a mysterious yet formidable opponent uh, for Jude Law's character. And... Uh, everyone else seems to be a, doing a pretty good job, though. I'm not sure how uh, making Bob Hoskins Nikita Khrushchev was the best move. Um, thankfully, he's not in the movie very long, but other than that, um, I think everyone else does a pretty decent job. Um, as I said, this is uh, this is shot like a typical war movie, and I think it uh, it over dramatizes uh, certain events and certain policies, especially. Um, the policy of, I believe it was Order 277, of um, Stalin gave the order for not one step backwards, um, and uh, commissars of the uh, NKVD, the precursor to the KGB, uh, would uh, theoretically be uh, given the authority to shoot deserters uh, in, uh, in order to persuade the troops to uh, that retreat was not an option and that they had to continue forward because that by this point the Germans had uh, gotten very close to Moscow and they conquered uh, very much uh, a good portion of the Soviet Union at this point and the Soviets were getting desperate at this point and uh, they hadn't gotten their full um, military might up to running and so their the momentum was definitely not on their side so this was a, a move born out of desperation in real life it didn't do a whole lot and it kind of quietly got shelved after a while and uh, it wasn't nearly as um, dramatic and uh, and brutal as they uh, show it in the film but of course that's Hollywood for you and uh, although I will say um, well, uh, of course, this is a historical event and certain parallels will be formed, but the opening sequence of this film where um, the Jude Law's character goes uh, from the train onto the docks uh, in the boats over, being strafed by Stuka, Stuka dive bombers, get on the other side of the river, get handed ammo, and then go to try to the, the charge to retake Red Square. The way it's shot and how it's uh, put together um, I swear that uh, the people who made the original Call of Duty probably copied off this film. So there's, a, I guess, props to you, uh, to them, I guess, uh, for um, uh, Im imitation is the highest form of flattery in that regard. Um, as far as comparing it to things, 
I mean, it's a standard war film, I'd say. Though, I will say the love triangle aspect, it didn't really fit in with the historical drama that's going on around it. I thought the historical piece should have been good enough. And you could draw the parallel to another war film that came out uh, within months of this film coming out of two, in, two, uh, in 2001, namely Pearl Harbor. Uh, Pearl Harbor also featured that... Uh, that love triangle that really didn't fit into, uh, they kind of had to jam that love story into and around the real life historical drama and the two things just kind of clash together and don't really fit. Um, it's not quite as bad with Enemy at the Gates, but there's a comparison to be made there. And also, um, one thing I will say about this, uh, this film that uh, sounds, uh, you, I keep saying that uh, in my reviews that uh, plot development, the character arcs seem familiar and then I point to where you've seen them before. But this is something uh, that I wasn't expecting and here's something that I, I, I've heard before. Um, when, uh, when composing music for films, it's not entirely uncommon for composers to uh, borrow from their own work, especially when they're in time crunch. And so when you see two movies that are composed by the same person back to back, um, they might hear some similarities with them. Some examples include um, Hans Zimmer, who uh, after making Gladiator, uh, he was uh, brought in late in the project to compose uh, the music for um, the first Pirates of the Caribbean, The Curse of the Black Pearl, and uh, as a result, certain riffs of the Pirates of the Caribbean theme song sound very similar to uh, certain songs in Gladiator. So there's a comparison, uh, there's a example. Another example would be John Williams, who uh, I believe both in 2002, he uh, composed the scores for both uh, Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets and Star Wars Episode Two: Attack of the Clones. And so, and so the music uh, in Harry Potter and uh, Chamber of Secrets during the Quidditch match, um, there, there's a brief uh, segment of that uh, music that sounds identical to the music that he used during the speeder chase in Coruscant or, uh, during Attack of the Clones. And then in this uh, Enemy of the Gates, uh, this was composed by Jack Horner. He's a great composer. One of my uh, favorite pieces of his is the score to the scene where, where Kirk and the crew kit, uh, steal back the Enterprise from Star Trek III. I love that uh, score. I thought that did a great job in that. But um, in Enemy at the Gates, I wasn't expecting this. He used pretty much the exact same music from an earlier film of his, Balto. And uh, it's not just one fleeting instance of this. He uses this music several times during Enemy at the Gates, and it's kind of distracting. Uh, for comparison, here's uh, what it so uh, sounds like in Enemy at the Gates. And then here's what it sounds like uh, in Balto. See, uh, hear the resemblance? They're pretty much identical, aren't they? In Enemy of Gates, there's at least two, uh, probably three or four times, where he uses the exact same music. And I didn't, rec I didn't quite catch it at first. It sounded very familiar, but then I, when I nailed it, it was very distracting, especially when in, he uses this music during a emotional scene. And that, that just was very distracting to me. And also, one last nitpick I will say for Enemy at the Gates is the very uh, the way this film ends. Um, I thought that when we find out that um, uh, Rachel Weiss's character who was wounded and it was taken to a hospital on the uh, other side of the Volga, um, and uh, Jude Law's character uh, seeks her out in the hospital because she wrote to him, um, we see that their eyes meet. He goes, she starts walking uh, towards her, and then the, the camera starts panning out, and you see the entire hospital uh, full of wounded uh, in various stages. Uh, I'm assuming to, like, I mean, the usual uh, war uh, commentary to see the, cal the, the true cost of war. I mean, that would have been great, but then you start the zoom out, and then it cuts right back to a weird uh, mid-distance uh, shot that's, like, across the aisle and far and down away from Jude Laws and Rachel Weiss, they're sitting down, they don't say, you don't hear them say anything, and then it ends. 
that just seemed like a weird edit to me and um, I thought if you just uh, faded to black from the zoom out then that probably would have worked that would have been nice but uh, as it is that's probably not the best edit to end on but those are just nitpicks on my front um, overall I would say Enemy of the Gates is a solid uh, war film not necessarily my favorite uh, World War II uh, film. There are uh, definitely others. I mean, obviously, The Great Escape, my favorite film of all time, uh, would be better. But still, uh, still worth watch. If you haven't seen it before, go check it out. Uh, I think you'll think you'll enjoy it. So. Those are my thoughts on Ending Mid the Gates. Uh, be sure to look for my next my movie review, which will be for uh, Joker, which comes out October 4th. Uh, I may do one or two more. Uh, I've never seen it before reviews before then, who knows? And uh, also, I appreciate whatever audience I can get. Thank you so much for watching. And uh, if it wouldn't be so uh, uh, too much trouble, if you like what you see here or anywhere else on my channel, please give me a like, share, subscribe. I'd very much appreciate it. Again, thank you so much for watching. You're the guys of the greatest. And just remember, there is nothing new under the sun. And yes, you have seen it before.